Let me get one thing out of the way in a hurry here at the beginning. I mentioned a book to you by Vody Bauckham that my wife recommended to me to read, and boy, am I glad I read it before this conference, because he deals with worldview. What's a Christian worldview? And it's fault lines, the social justice movement and evangelicalism's looming catastrophe. He's a black pastor, and he speaks very forthrightly and very straightforward as a black man living in America in the situation we find ourselves in. And he says we as evangelicals have allowed that counterculture movement and the political correctness and so many other things that are involved out there. We, we've got too many evangelicals and included the Southern Baptist Convention recently gave in to critical race theory. And he says that's the most foolish thing we could do. And he draws back, he, he talks about our worldview. Uh, if we do that, uh, we demonstrate our worldview is not a biblical worldview. Very interesting, very challenging book. He knows what he's talking about. It's not just because he's black and an evangelical, not just because a friend of John MacArthur. It's the idea that he has actually studied this out. He gives you citations. He quotes books that are highlighted in the secular world and by our government and by our education system for what are the so quote-unquote Bibles of critical race theory. And he speaks very honestly and forthrightly. So I just wanted to recommend this. It's not included in the list of books at the back of your notes. And I wish it was because of the fact that as I found it after I'd prepared the notes and had the other conference as well, and I thought, oh, wow, this is powerful. It's powerful. Uh, don't make the mistake the Southern Baptist Convention made. Don't make the mistake that Al Mohler made. And he will tell you he made a huge mistake by not speaking up at the convention when it came to the floor. So, men, it begins again. The battle, as Vody brings out in this book, the battle is over two very different worldviews. And as believers, as Christians, we need to have a faith-driven worldview, a biblically-based worldview, a Christ-centered worldview. If we don't have that kind of worldview, we are in deep trouble because we're missing the point of why we're here. We're missing the point of what the church is supposed to be all about. We're missing the point of what we as Christians ought to be doing in serving our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the antidote to all the confusion. Uh, you listen to young people today. The world has gone and tried to inculcate and imbue them with the world's view, the world's worldview. And we're missing the opportunity of influencing them for Christ, challenge them with the life and message of Christ, and especially our Christian young people. Uh, we have no guarantee that they're going to last or stay in the church or stay faithful to Christ if we don't prepare them for what they're going to face out there. And you've got to begin right where we began the first two messages. It's got to be Christ-centered. The more we can inculcate Christ and his message into the lives of our young people, our own children, our own grandchildren, the more they'll be capable of facing what they face in this world. And I'm convinced that churches who fail to do that, churches who just try to entertain, churches who just try to, well, we, we have good programs for our children, for our young people, and, and we, we preach to them, and we do all kinds of things, but wait a minute. What is being involved? What is the core? We had to go through this in our church. What do we want our youth program to accomplish? And we decided it had to be this. It had to be that our, our youth program had to not only proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to teach our young people who Jesus Christ is from his word and to encourage them to live a Christ-like life and to constantly challenge them to obey Christ. And we had to have every 
everything that was taught and said come back again to Christ as the focal point. That's often hard to do. And sometimes we get distracted by too many programs that aren't Christ-centered. So my introduction is we should live all our life in accord with biblical principles. We've got to start there with a faith-driven worldview. Christians with a truly Christian worldview will know that all of life is to be lived in accordance with what the Bible teaches us. That's number one. Secondly, we must recognize that the Bible teaches that truth is objective, not subjective. It's not our truth, it's God's truth. It's not relative truth, it's absolute truth. And in this world today, everyone is telling our young people, and they're telling adults as well, it's a part of the program when we get out there, not only in commercials, but even in sports, and everything is organized to try to tell us there is no such thing as absolute truth. That we make our own truth. That we're our own spiritual authority. That we have the power and authority to determine what is right and wrong. No, we don't. It's the Bible that teaches objective truth. A secular worldview, on the other hand, teaches that truth exists along a continuum that is constantly changing. That's not objective, absolute truth, if if it's constantly changing. Absolute truth is unchanging. The Bible is unchanging. The Word of God does not change. God does not change. We change, the world changes, science changes, politics changes, sociology changes, psychiatry changes, but the word of God and our God never changes. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's unchanging. Read James about our unchanging God in whom there is no shadow of turning and no different light His light is one. His testimony is one. The secular worldview is prevalent even within the church, unfortunately. You see it all too often. It it creeps in. There's an encouraging of a secular mindset in many churches. And it turns to rejecting discernment and saying discernment is not necessary. Truth is unknowable. And discerning Christians are only those who cause division. Did you ever hear that? Christians accused of causing division because they're speaking truth? We saw it in our church. We've experienced it. Where those who were standing for truth were accused of causing division. Is there wrong causing of division? Of course. The Bible clearly teaches about that. We're not to be divisive in a fleshly, worldly, unbiblical way, but if by following absolute truth of the Bible, it creates division, that's a division that God intends. There is an absolute distinction between belief and unbelief. There's an absolute distinction between being saved and lost. There's an absolute distinction between being biblical and being unbiblical. There's an absolute distinction between being a, following secular humanism and following biblical supernaturalism. They are very different. And thirdly, the Christian's worldview differs distinctly from the unbelieving world's worldview. That's really the bottom line. That's really a summary of everything we set up to this point, especially in that second message from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So what does a Christian biblical worldview include? Now, there are a number of lists. But I like the one that Tim Challies gives in the discipline of spiritual discernment. And so I have utilized that and copied that. Wayne Grudem also selects key points in the biblical worldview. But I decided not to follow Wayne Grudem's. Uh, it's very close to this other one by Tim Challies in the discipline of spiritual discernment. And uh, my wife and I read that book together. And I ended up recommending it to one of our grandchildren. In fact, the grandchild, the grandson who became a Christian just a few years ago, I recommend he read this book because it really had a message that I felt he was ready for in the stage that he was at in his Christian growth. 
And we both came away from reading that book saying, you know, Chalice has really hit upon a point here that we need to pay attention to. So here are the six Ste- the six things listed, the six topics, the six subject matters that must be included in what we would call a Christian or a biblical worldview. And this is according to Tim Challies, and I'm going to use it because it's a handy one and because I agree with it mostly here. First of all, he begins with Jesus Christ, which is my, I told you already, I'm convinced of that. That's what my first two topics, first two messages were all about. He says, number one, Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Why begin there? Because of the world's view of Christ. Secondly, God is the all-powerful and all-knowing creator of the universe, and he still rules it today. And I think you have to include in that that the Lord is Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 28, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore, right? We have to recognize that. God, which is here also referring to our Savior Jesus Christ, is the all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, and he still rules it today. That's something I find in the Grand Canyon, even when we have Christians come through, we have many Christians come through and say, well, I, I, I just can't accept a literal six-day creation. Or I have, a, I have a difficult time believing that there is a global flood, a global catastrophic flood. And one of the first things I try to tell them is, well, wait a minute now. Don't misunderstand what we're going, going to be doing here in the canyon. We're not coming here to prove the Bible is true. We don't need proof that the Bible is true. The Bible doesn't depend on external, extra-biblical testimony for its truth and its authority. So don't look at it as we're trying to prove to you the Bible's true. No, we accept the Bible as true, as absolute truth, and as objective uh, truth. And the reason we talk here in the canyon about creation and flood is that we believe that when you read the Bible and you say, okay, what? If, if there really was a worldwide flood, what would you expect to see in the rocks? And we talk about what the Bible says about that flood. We go through Genesis chapter 6 through 9. And we try to pick out all the evidences in the Bible that describe what that flood was and what it was like and why it, was, why it came upon the earth. And we say, that's what we must believe. We don't have this idea that God said it, the evidence proves it, therefore I believe it. No. And it's not, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. No. God said it, that settles it. No matter what I believe, and no matter what we claim as evidence outside the Bible. That's a very difficult thing to try to get people to understand. The third is salvation is a gift from God and cannot be earned. Again, it's salvation is Christ-oriented, Christ-centered, Christ-accomplished. He is our Redeemer. He is our Savior. He is our Reconciler. He is the propitiation of our sins. All the things that Job talks about, he's our mediator. Those are all in Christ. Again, we're Christ-centered. Salvation is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. In other words, there's no salvation by works. Fourth, Satan is real. And with that, we understand that evil is real. That the fall is real. Do you know why? And I've ha- it's, it's surprised me, and I don't know why it has surprised me, because it shouldn't surprise us. But over and over and over again, in talking about creation and a literal six-day creation and how we ought to treat Genesis chapters 1 through 11 with as historically accurate, that there are still those who come and they say, no, I can't accept that. And so you say, but wait a minute, can you accept the fall and a literal historical Adam and that mankind really fell? And so often, 
I find them saying, well, well, no, that's merely symbolic. It's merely represent, representative. An evangelical who signs the doctoral statement of the Evangelical Theological Society can stand and say he does not believe in historical Adam and he does not believe that the fall took place exactly the way the scripture describes it. The scripture is symbolic and metaphoric in the way it describes it. I've met him in debates. It's Dr. John Walton, formerly of Wheaton. And it's, it's just... What do you do then? The gospel is destroyed. Because, you know, and, and it, it will amaze you how different men have held these views through the years and how it has impacted their theology and what they believe and what they teach. And if we don't have a real historical fall of mankind, what's the need of salvation? What's the need of a savior? And if the historical Adam isn't the original head of the human race and that there were millions of other human beings upon the earth when God selected him just to be representative as a archetype of what God desires in a man of God, then what about all those other millions? What's, how, how are they saved? Are you saying then that Adam's the only one and all his descendants are the only ones who fell and the others are not sinners? then what do you do with Romans chapter 3? What do you do with Romans chapter 5? What do you do with Romans chapter 8? Pretty soon you're sitting there saying, you know, I can't believe what Paul says because Paul depends upon the historical accuracy of Genesis chapters 1 through 3. Satan is real. Evil is real. Wickedness is real. We can't emphasize that enough. It's gotten to day where it's not politically correct to say someone's a sinner. It's not politically correct. It's countered the current culture to say that there's wickedness in this world, that there's evil, unless you're only talking about political evil. <laughs> All right? But morality? Morality is what each person decides it is according to how they're taught in the secular humanistic classrooms of our nation. Fifth, Christians have a responsibility to share their faith in Christ with other people. Again, it's Christ-centered, Christ-oriented, and he is the proclamation. He is the message. It's the cross-centered message. It's the Christ-centered message. That's got to be part of our biblical worldview. We can't say, well, I have a biblical worldview, but it does not include proclaiming the gospel to others. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New, God never gave his people the option of remaining silent. And lastly, and you could add to these, you could go, I think, almost endlessly just adding things as you go through here, but trying to keep it basic and simple, the Bible is accurate in all of its teachings. And some have asked me, well, why don't you put that first? It could be put first. But again, as I showed from what Christ taught and what Paul taught, we really have to begin with Christ. And if Christ is who he claimed to be, and if Christ is truly the Son of God, then we must believe his words. We can't accept him and not accept his words. The authority of Scripture, the integrity of Scripture, the accuracy of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture all goes back to whose word is it? And that's why in the Gospel of John it begins by, in the beginning was the word. And it goes on to say that that word is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. So those are the six things that I think are minimal. We could add to them. We could expand them. We could divide them up and show different things. But those six things are, I think, absolute essentials to a biblical worldview. So first of all, we must stay focused on Christ. Christ teaching instructs us how to live. We saw that in Matthew chapter 5. We see it in the Sermon on the Mount. 
I can remember years ago as a Bible college student getting hold of Martin Lloyd-Jones's commentary on the Sermon on the Mount. And it's that commentary went volume after volume after volume. It was so long. And I can remember thinking, man, can't he put it slower or, or shorter than that? Can't we get through the, this quicker? Why is this so important? We have a whole rest of the Bible to deal with. And then I remember coming home from Bangladesh, and the first time we started attending Placerita Bible Church, uh, there was an associate pastor there who was teaching in the adult Sunday school class, and every Sunday he was in the Sermon on the Mount. And he covered one verse each Sunday. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is all of chapter 5, all of chapter 6, all of chapter 7. And I remember at one point thinking, man, we're going to be here a long time. But you know, there was, came a point in that teaching when I suddenly thought, you know what? This is, if there's any part of the Word of God that we ought to pay attention to, it's the Sermon on the Mount. The Spirit of God, superintending Matthew and writing his gospel, gives it center stage in the ministry of Christ. It's significant, it's important, and we can't exhaust it. And it is terribly convicting when we read it prayerfully, looking at ourselves in the mirror of God's word. It's very convicting. Jesus tells us how to live. And the rest of the New Testament builds on that. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Christ's gospel distinguishes our worldview from all other worldviews. That's what we found out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So that staying focused on Christ is number one. And we've seen that with what Christ teaches in Matthew 5 and all the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. We see it in Christ's gospel being distinguished from the world's worldview and its wickedness in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. We move to the second point, thinking rightly about God. Who is God? Who is God? You see, one's view of God, according to some, is the starting point of all worldviews. Because what we think of God is going to determine what we think of the need of salvation, what we think of what sin is. It's got to be God-focused. To be Christians who have what is truly a Christian worldview, it's critical that we think rightly about God, that we understand exactly who he is. And where do we find out? Only one place, the scriptures. Oh, you can point to natural revelation, Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. And Paul says that in creation, we see the power of the Godhead and who, that God exists and that he will judge. But that's not sufficient. That's a very partial picture. We need special revelation for that. And we need to be imbued with the word of God and what it says about who God is. It must, our worldview, a biblical worldview must explain to others who God is and how he is related to how we live, how we view life, how we view the world around us, and how we deal with our encounters with evil and wickedness. It has to involve his relationship to us and our relationship to him. Mark those phrases so often in the Old Testament by the prophets, where God says, I am your God and you are my people. The highest name of God, Yahweh, is a title of his covenant relationship to his people. Our God is a God of relationships. Our God is personal. We have a personal relationship with him. And he desires his people to recognize that same purposeful interpersonal relationships with the believers in the family of God. He depicts us as a family. He depicts Israel as a family. He depicts the church as a family. I had a chuckle and I don't know, I don't remember ex right now exactly who it was yesterday uh, when we were here in church and we started moving chairs and I 
started picking up chairs and stacking them. And uh, someone said to me, uh, guests uh, aren't required to do that. And I says, oh, but I'm family. I'm family. And families pitch in, right? That's the way we ought to be everywhere. I can remember our own church. I, I mean, I know I'm old. Come on. You know, my children remind me of that. My, grand, my grandchildren think I am ancient of days and as old as dirt, you know. And uh, my great-grandchildren aren't old enough to think what I am, <laughs> which is very encouraging. They just ignore me. They, just, they, they ignore what I look like or anything and just love me, and I love them. And, and I, I remember one day they called for volunteers in the church to move all the chairs. We have a big auditorium to have to move all these chairs, set them aside, get ready for a women's event later in the week, and we're going to set up tables and everything. And I showed up, and I was working and one of the men came to me and said, Bill, what are you doing? This is young men's work. And I said, no, it's family work. The old and the young pitch in. That's how we get to know one another. We serve alongside each other. We're family. That's exactly what's got to be involved. And this is something we need to remember in our ministry. It's about people. It's about people. A fellow student of mine when I was in Bible college, went on to become a pastor in a church in Montana. And one day he showed up at the church and here he was dressed in his nice suit and white shirt and tie and everything, shoes all polished and shining. What was he doing? He only came to sit in his office and pray and to read and study the word of God and prepare his message. But there was a fire. And the fire was burning a vacant lot near the church. It was a brush fire, a grass fire that was rapidly spreading. And he just looked at it, walked inside, picked up the phone, called the fire department, says, we got a fire out here. And then one of the deacons came by, was out there fighting the fire, and he found out the pastor was in his office. And he walked in. He said, Pastor, what are you doing? What are you thinking? I, I'm here doing the work of God. I'm, I'm here praying and studying the word. He said, Pastor, this church could burn down. You got to get out there. And the pastor responded, well, look at me. I'm all dressed up. I got a white shirt. I got a tie. I got a suit. I can't go out there and fight that fire. That's for someone else to fight, not me. I got more important things to do in here. He didn't understand. Those clothes are nothing. Take off the jacket, take off the tie, allow your white shirt to get burned and dusty and dirty and grimy. Get out there and do the work. A pastor friend of mine in Douglas, Wyoming said, Bill, come over and preach for us. So I drove her from Casper. He says, I want you to arrive on Friday because he says, I want you to go calling with me on Saturday. I said, oh, I look forward to that. That would be fantastic. What an experience. Older man, experienced pastor, I just, you know, that was exciting to me as a young man, to have that kind of relationship with someone like him. He says, Bill, what are you thinking about what you're going to wear Friday and Saturday? And I said, well, I'll come prepared to be, you know, dressed on Sunday. I'll have a jacket and shirt and tie and uh, shine, up, shine up my shoes. He says, no, 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 I ask you, well, how are you going to dress Friday and Saturday? And I says, well, I didn't think about that. He says, oh, but you need to think about it. He says, here's what I want you to do. You wear boots. You wear Levi's. Better yet, wear coveralls. Levi coveralls, bib trousers, whatever you want to call them. A hat and a pair of leather gloves. And I thought, I thought he said visitation. So I got there. Friday night, went to sleep, early Saturday morning. Had to be at his door at 7 a.m. I got there. It was Pastor George Steppen. And I said, Pastor Steppen, I'm ready. I just don't understand what kind of visitation you're talking about to be dressed like this. I said, is it because you got a sewer back up in the church? Or is it, you know, what's going on? He said, No. He said, I'm taking you into my vineyard, into my mission field. And we drove out of Douglas and went out among the ranches. And he said, see that group of 
Men over there, they're working on a fence line. They're repairing fence. We're going to stop. We're going to help them build the fence. We're going to help them do the repairing the fence, barbed wire fence. So that's why you need those gloves. And he was out there working alongside them, and I thought, man, where's the spirituality of this? And all of a sudden, he began to speak the word of God to the men around him. He had memorized the entire book of Proverbs. And he had a proverb out of the book of Proverbs for every single situation. I just was amazed. And he, he built a conversation with those men while they worked. We go on. Someone was haying. We're going to help with the haying. Go on. Someone's gathering the cattle. We're going to help them gather the cattle. Whatever we found the ranchers doing, we worked alongside of him. He was busy teaching and speaking the word of God and finding every opportunity to give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. What was most amazing was rancher after rancher after rancher shook his hand after the hours we spent with him. And we got to three or four different ranches until it was too dark to do any more and we headed home because I had to preach the next morning. And he said, I, I trust that we haven't hindered you in your preparation for tomorrow because you should have really been ready before you came. Okay. <laughs> but rancher after rancher said, Pastor, I'll be there Sunday morning. He says, this is the speaker right here. Oh, this young man who's working alongside you, he's going to preach. Okay, I'll definitely be there. I learned that you've got to love people. You've got to get alongside people. You've got to rub shoulders with people. You've got to care for them. You've got to get involved in their lives. Anything different is not the work of God. Anything different is not thinking rightly about God. Anything different is not reflecting who our God is and who Jesus Christ is. So God is our creator. We know that from Genesis chapter 1 and elsewhere. God is our Lord. We know that from Psalm 8. So he has all authority and power. He commands us. And fearing God is the foundation of all biblical wisdom and understanding and knowledge. We see that in Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 where we have wisdom is the beginning of of the fear of God, or the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, excuse me, get it the other way around. And Job 28, 28, and many other places of scripture teach that. We've got to realize that these are all involved with thinking rightly about God. So thirdly, emphasizing God's gift of salvation. Going back to Christ, going back to the gospel, going back to the message we have. Christians have experienced salvation. Romans chapter 10 is the most beautiful chapter. You were there. Sunday morning, Rex had an outstanding message on Romans 10, 14 and following. It was, you know, you can't miss going to that passage. It is so marvelous. It's, and, and there you saw again, where is salvation? It's in the word of Christ. It's in the word of God. And Ephesians chapter 1 describes that salvation, describes our Savior and only done. We've experienced salvation. That salvation is provided by our Savior and Lord. And salvation, secondly, can be obtained only through Christ. There's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. It's Christ alone. Yes, we're exclusive in our thinking. Yes, our worldview is exclusive, not inclusive. The truth is found only in Christ. Salvation is found only in Christ. Faith must be only in Christ as taught in the word of God. Thirdly, salvation comes only by means of that gospel. Paul said, Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and then also the Greek or the Gentile. And then I love 2 Timothy 3.15. And I'm going to turn there and read that because as I look at this passage, and it's right before we're told all scripture is inspired by God. But what do we have there? He's talking about Timothy. And he says in verse 14, Timothy, however, 
Continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known what? The sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. There's that wisdom again. Do you know there's only one other passage of Scripture that talks about salvation and wisdom together in this fashion? And that's Psalm 19, verse 7. I think Paul is referring back to that and reminding Timothy of the truth of Psalm 19, verse 7. The wisdom that leads to salvation. The wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about all scripture. And I think it's because he's already, he's already alluded to the scriptures in the Old Testament. And he's also noting here that Timothy came to salvation and the wisdom of salvation through the Old Testament scriptures. So the gospel is not just in the New Testament. The oldest book in the Bible is Job, and boy, does it have a clarity of the gospel. I was just talking to someone about that and saying, isn't that amazing? That from the very start, the oldest book of the Bible, the oldest event recorded in the Bible is creation and what comes after that with the fall and what we have in Genesis 3.15. We have a gospel message that the seed of the woman is going to conquer the seed of the serpent. That's the first gospel right there. So no matter whether you're looking at historically the earliest event, the gospel is there, or historically you're looking at the earliest and oldest book written, Job, the gospel is still there. Salvation comes only by means of the gospel. And fourthly, Christians must take the gospel to all peoples. That's the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. That's got to be part of our worldview. It's not included in our worldview. It's not a biblical worldview. And fourthly, recognizing the reality of Satan. And this is very sad because many who consider themselves Christians have a worldview that is completely inconsistent with their profession of faith and the fact that they were sinners and that they are in need of salvation. And the reason there's sin in the world is because of the fall and Adam's disobedience, but also because there is an enemy at work in the world with whom we must deal and whom we must know about and whom we need the armor of God, the full armor of God, to do battle with him. And part of that armor is the word of God. The word of God is our sword against him. And the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And Satan is the one who goes about as a roaring lion, Peter says, seeking whom he might be able to devour. There's a reality here that we have to live with and understand. And ultimately, worldviews tend to be rooted in a person's own sinfulness. Think about that for a minute. I tell young people, you do have a worldview, but mark my word, even if you're a Christian, your worldview at your stage of life is probably more determined by your own sinfulness than anything. Because we have a problem with sin, we have a problem with evil, we have a problem with wickedness, we have a problem with yielding to the world, and we have need of fighting that battle every day. Evil is a reality in the world. I like what Charles Swindoll said, and I found this quote in The Tale of the Tardy Ox Cart and 1,501 Other Stories to use as illustrations, okay? He said this, because of sin, man has taken the deity out of religion, the supernatural out of Christianity, the authority from the Bible, God out of education, morality and virtue out of literature, beauty and truth out of art, ethics out of business, and fidelity out of marriage. That's what sin has done. And that's what Satan is about. Evil is a reality. We're going to face evil. We have to know what to do in the face of evil. And we have to deal with that temptation to evil ourselves in our own lives. 
And it's very important for every one of us. I don't care how old we are or how long we've been saved. That is a constant daily battle. And that's why Jesus said, take up my cross and follow me. We have to crucify that flesh day in and day out. Now, there's ways I know, theologically and every other way, that yes, we have been crucified with Christ already, right? The problem is sometimes we don't live like it. Secondly, Satan opposes the work of God and the people of God. You see that in Zechariah chapter 3 where he accuses Joshua, the high priest. We see it in Job chapter 1 and 2 where Satan accuses Job. Satan is our enemy. It's a foolish believer who doesn't think that he or she has an enemy in this world that is stronger and greater than we are. If we don't realize that, and if we don't rightly realize who we are, we don't rightly realize and understand how the word of God is so necessary for us as a weapon against it and how we must fight that battle only through Jesus Christ because he is the one who gains the victory, not you and I. My father was a chronic alcoholic. I mentioned that the other day. After he was saved, he kept having these lapses back to drinking and becoming drunk. I mean, he'd go a whole year, two years, and be just fine, and then all of a sudden, boom. And he'd start weeping. And he'd go see our dear pastor, Pastor John, Dr. John Widenar. And he'd say, Pastor John, I failed. Pastor John would say, George, Yes, you failed. Do you know why? Because you think you can conquer your problem. You're depending upon yourself. You haven't really given it up to Christ totally and completely and finally. And until you do, you're going to constantly have this problem. Then about, be about almost 10 years later, it has to be. Ten years later, I came home from seminary and I was talking with my dad. I said, Dad, you just seem so relaxed. You just seem like everything's fine. What's happened? He says, well, Christ finally got the victory. And I didn't understand what he was talking about. I said, well, of course he did. He saved you. We have a family of believers because Christ has saved us. And I said, you know, I became a believer by watching you become a believer. So I know that Christ has the victory. He says, no, Bill, I'm talking about my drinking. He said, I've been absolutely clean and without temptation and nothing because I finally said, went before the Lord and he says, I got on my knees and my face before God and I cried out and I said, God, I've got to stop trying to do this for you and allow you to do it for me. I've got to yield my addiction. I've got to yield my temptation. I've got to yield my alcoholism to you. Lord, I cannot do this. You never intended for me to do this. And I'm showing a lack of faith in you and a lack of trust in you. And I'm not glorifying you by trying to do it myself. He said, a week later, I went to see my new pastor out at Riverview Baptist Church. And I went to tell him, I've finally done it. I've given over to Christ. I'm not going to try to take care of it myself anymore. To his dying day, it never came back. You and I sometimes keep trying to solve our problems or the problems of others without realizing no, we can't. We don't have the wisdom. We don't have the power. We need to give it over to God and we need to give it to Christ and allow him to work in us. Only then will we see the victory in individual personal lives. I've dealt with drug addicts, alcoholics. I've dealt with those who are addicted to pornography. Dealt with serial adulterers. Go on down the list, so many things. 
thieves, liars, etc. And every time it comes down to that, you say you're a believer, but are you really giving over your addiction, your problem, your Achilles heel to the Lord and letting him solve it, or you keep trying to solve it yourself? If you keep trying to solve it yourself, you will never solve it. Why do you have a Savior if you don't need him? Let's move on. Last point. Standing on the foundation of biblical accuracy. Dan Story wrote a book called Christianity on the Offense, Responding to the Beliefs and Assumptions of Spiritual Seekers. It was published 24 years ago in 1998. He said this, quote, As I have repeatedly emphasized, contradicting worldviews cannot all be true. Only one can be true. If the Christian worldview is true, it alone reflects absolute reality. What is real about God, people, and life, and all other religions are false. End quote. Why? Because the word of God has all the answers right here. We don't need to seek them anywhere else. It's here. This is the foundation of our biblical worldview, our Christian worldview. You see, because biblical truth matters. That's what we talked about on Sunday afternoon out of John chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, John chapter 17, verse 17, Psalm 119, verses 43 and 160. That was part of the truth. It's there, and you can go to many other passages of Scripture, scripture to see this, but it's amazing how often John himself deals with this and brings it out. Biblical truth matters. And too often we ask questions about what's going, around, uh, going on around us and in the world without turning the Bible to get the answer. Biblical truth matters. We need to seek the biblical truth about the matter. Secondly, biblical inerrancy matters. His word is inerrant without error. We need to realize that. In Genesis chapter 1, when God says six times, it happened thus, it happened so, or so it happened. If you think about translation, you're looking at Literally, the Hebrew says, it happened exactly this way. In other words, God is saying, look, I've told you the truth. This is exactly how it happened. That same phrase is used in 2 Kings chapter 15, I believe it's verse 20, where it's a prophecy about Jehu and the four generations from Jehu, and that's said there that that prophecy gives the prophecy all over again. It's already in chapter 10, verse 30 is where it's given in 2 Kings. But you come there, and it says it's fulfilled. And how does it say it's fulfilled? It used exactly the same phrase that's used six times in Genesis chapter 1. It happened exactly that way. That's why we've got to believe that the creation account is the true account, that it's inerrant. No matter what we think, no matter what problems we think are there and what difficulties it provides to us to actually believe it and accept it, God says six times to us, it happened exactly that way. Get over it, fool, basically. God had to say it six times because he knows who we are. He knows what was going to happen. He knows the fall is coming. He knows all those things, and he had the Spirit have Moses as Moses is retelling what he's received by divine revelation because Moses wasn't there, and no scientist was there, and we weren't there, and Job wasn't there. No one was there but God alone. He is the eyewitness. And when we deny what God emphatically says six times, it happened exactly this way. We're saying God is not a trustworthy witness. I believe the Jews ran into that same problem. That's why they accused Christ and why they didn't accept the witness of Christ either. Biblical inerrancy matters. Biblical authority matters. Rene Posh, a French author, said this. Spiritual authority is what? Well, there's one type of spiritual authority whereby the authority of the Lord and his written revelation is our spiritual authority. But then there are others who come along and say, no, 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 that's not the basis or that's not spiritual authority. The authority of the church and its infallible popes, and I'm using that in quotes and I'm using that generically, referring to any teacher of the word of God as being a pope or an authority. 
No, our spiritual authority is not based upon the church and its dictates, the church and its proclamations, or the teachers within the church upon human beings. No, it's only on God and his written revelation. And what is today, what's being taught, what is said in secular humanism, the authority of human reason and its self-styled sovereignty. That's where the world is. That's their worldview. Spiritual authority is me, whoever we are. We have the final say. We are determiner of truth. That's just not so. It's just not so. It's got to be the Lord and his written revelation. This is the last point, and I have then the conclusion. But I remembered very clearly something that I learned in Bangladesh as a missionary. We had these interminable debates about what comprises a church. And we had what I feel are very unbiblical standards that were laid down by our mission organization, very well intended, intending to be based upon scripture, but basically you could not be a church if you did not have a doctrinal statement. And you did not have the principles of being a Baptist. The Baptist distinctives. That is absolutely false. What makes church? Jesus. And a group of believers who yield to what? What's our only solid authority and determining factor? Here, the word of God. We finally reached the, the decision on our field, and thankfully our field supervisor back on the East Coast of the United States says, you're actually right. What we're saying is, is this a church? Do they have the Bible? Do they accept the Bible as their sole authority for faith and practice? Are they a group of believers in Jesus Christ proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are they practicing and being obedient to what the word says, including believers' baptism, observing the Lord's Supper? They need no other documentation. They are a church. I don't know how we got off on that, but even in the Reformation, suddenly we began to develop all these biblical so-called doctrinal statements and making them the measure of whether or not we're a church, whether or not we're a believer. No, it's all right here. And these, those were all well-intentioned. Don't get me wrong. And they're a value in their own way, and they provide some teaching, some, some types of catechism for teaching basic Christian doctrine. But that does not determine what a church is. It really gets to that point almost of saying the authority of the church and its infallible popes and its human documentation. <laughs> no, it's a church before they even write their doctrinal statements. It's a church even before they uh, establish their, their uh, Baptist distinctives or whatever distinctives, all right? Let's go to the conclusion. It's time to wrap this up. First of all, a biblical view must arise out of the scriptures themselves. A biblical worldview must arise out of the scriptures. This is our foundation. This is our authority. A biblical worldview must be lived, not just thought. That's part of the issue you see here, is how we live declares what our worldview is. A biblical worldview must be situated in the broader context of a lived out faith to glorify Christ and to be Christ-like in our behavior and to be obedient to his word and scripture. It demonstrates how we connect our faith to how we act, how we live. That makes it a biblical worldview. It's to be lived out. A biblical worldview must actually change how we live. That's part of the issue. Worldview formation is not just a means of getting one's intellectual ducks in a row. It's the idea of how will I live for God in this world? How will I live for Christ in this world? That is my worldview, and we grow with that, and we change with that as we learn more from the word. 
our worldview must actually change how we live, how we behave. And just because we explain the world from a biblical framework does not mean that we possess a biblical worldview. You can explain all you want. You can understand. You can teach all you want. But what we need to do is do we live it? Do we live it? James talked about that. We must be doers of the word, not hearers only. But it also is true, and he talked about teaching and how it's important to be teachers and what the burden is upon teaching. We must do what we speak, what we preach, what we teach. Our speaking and teaching is worthless without living it. That's not always easy. It can come with a high price. But that's the only way to bring glory to God and glory to Christ is by living it. And the final point, a biblical worldview must continue to be developed the longer we live. We're never through with it. We're always learning. If we're not always learning, if we're not always learning from Scripture, I dare any of us to say with honesty, because it's not going to be honest if we claim it, that we understand everything in this book and that we are now living everything we ought to be living because of this book and what we're taught. None of us has reached the point, the acme where the apostle Paul was, and yet he admitted that even though he had finished his race and he pursued the higher things, he was still lacking. Our Savior is the only one to ever accomplish all of that. Praise the Lord. Our worldview is never going to end. We've got to develop it rightly. We've got to think about it carefully, but we've got to live it and be open to change and developing as we learn and grow in Christ. That's what we've got to teach our young people. That's what we've got to teach our old people. So what if someone's 98 years old as a believer and thinking they've arrived? No. No. <laughs> they haven't. In fact, I've, I find most old people recognize that better than any young people. <laughs> They're the ones first to admit, oh, <laughs> boy, I hope God gives me time to take care of some issues here I still have, you know. But every one of us needs this. Thanks for being so patient with me and listening, and thanks for being faithful here at Red Mesa and for those of you who are serving Christ in so many different ways, Germany and many other places, um, it's a joy to have been here with you and to share this with you. And I just pray that, you know, we don't just take this conference as, well, I've gained some knowledge. I now know what a worldview is. I have a definition. I have an idea where to go. I can develop one. I can write one. No, 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 no. Yes, those things are necessary, perhaps. Yes, we need to teach it to others, but the very most important thing is do we live it? It doesn't do any good to teach something unless we're living it. It's bound prayer. Lord, I come before you nothing more than an old shoe on a diseased foot. Sometimes the path seems hard. I feel the rocks in the worn soul. I feel the thorns in my own flesh from my own sinful character. I know that I am nothing without you. I have nothing without you. And that my Savior ought to be my all in all. Oh, how I long for the time when I get to heaven and see his face. But I'm reminded that it's more blessed to believe than to see his face and to walk by faith even now. And Lord, I pray that you'll help this servant to do what he has encouraged others to do. That is to live for you.
That's the most powerful message. But to realize that living it is merely living the life of my Savior who died and rose again, that I might have that life to live for him and to glorify him. May that be true of all of us. Bless each one in the ministries they have. Help everyone in this room to focus upon our Savior. I pray that each one of us, when we stand before you, will hear those precious words we long so much to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.